All right, thank you. Well, hey, welcome back. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned to you uh, in the morning that my, my ethnic background is Assyrian. And uh, for those of you who don't know, you know, the Assyrians had a really, um, have a long history of brutality. Unfortunately, we were incredibly uh, wicked people. We used to, uh, we were known for, you know, taking out our enemies. And once we conquered a people group, we would oftentimes chop off their heads and throw their heads against walls. We were known to gouge out people's eyeballs. Uh, we would skin people alive often. In fact, we were known to actually take our enemies' dead bodies and put them on spears, light them on fire, and use their burning bodies as light for our parties at night. We're a lot nicer now. Uh, I haven't hurt anybody today, so uh, be of good cheer. I won't kill you if you have a, a tough question. Um, you know, actually, I... I my parents wanted me to marry another Assyrian because they're like, well, we got to keep the Assyrian blood in, you know, and because there's just not that, there aren't that many Assyrians left on the planet, to be honest. So they were really eager that I'd marry another Assyrian. Uh, but the problem is every time I ran across another Assyrian, she was related to me, you know, and actually we, I actually have family who has married first cousins just so they can stay within like the, you know, ethnic Assyrian community. So uh, but I, I, I couldn't bring myself to do that. So uh, the woman I married, she's, um, she's an American. I mean, she's actually mostly German uh, in terms of ethnically. You know, it's funny, though, actually. <laughs> I married her, and, and we were, you know, we were new in our, our marriage. And we started thinking about the fact that we both got married together. And, she, and I'm thinking, look, the Assyrians have a history of brutality. But the Germans, you know, they got some issues in their history as well, you know. And so when we had our first kid, I was afraid he's going to turn out to be the Antichrist. You know, it's like the union of these two people groups. But now he's a good kid. I'm just kidding. He's 16, though, so you know why those of you who have 16-year-olds are, you know why I'm probably saying that. But again, enough about my problems. Let's, uh, let's talk about why we're here. Um, <clears throat> I have a, a friend who is, an, is a, a speaker friend of mine that we do a lot of work together. He's a retired homicide detective. And years ago, when he was back on the force, or when he was still on the force, he was uh, asked to go to investigate an officer-related shooting. And so many times, you know, he would go, and if there was some shooting, he would investigate to find out the details, make sure everything was, you know, done legitimately. And, and what had happened in this story is that um, a police officer had pulled over a motorist. And the police officer approached the motorist, asked the motorist to get and step outside the car, and the motorist got out of the car, and as soon as he did, the motorist pulled out a gun and pointed it right at the police officer. And the police officer was completely caught off guard, just flat-footed. He's like, oh my gosh, the guy just, he's got me. I'm, I'm stuck. What do I do? Now, the police officer had two options in his mind. One is he could do nothing and just let the, this motorist, a.k.a. a criminal now, get away with whatever he's going to get away with. Or he could go for his gun, you know, take it out of the holster, aim it at the bad guy, and try to take him out. But, of course, he knew if he did that, the motorist, the bad guy, would have gotten off at least a couple of shots at a very close range, and that would have been very, very dangerous. So the officer made this decision. He decided to go for his gun to shoot the bad guy. Now, let me tell you why he made that decision. When this particular police officer, and I don't know if this is the case for all police uh, officer districts and precincts and whatever, but I do know that in this case, that officer, when he was in his training, would oftentimes have uh, the police um, uh, who, who run the training camps take these bulletproof vests, and they would take them to the shooting range. They'd take them down range, set them up against the targets. Then they'd have those police officers go back and shoot at the vests, you know, because these are allegedly bulletproof vests. And what they soon discovered is once they went to inspect these vests, they realized, man, the, the bullets actually didn't go through. Now, it doesn't mean it's not going to hurt, but they saw that the vests were able to stop bullets. And so knowing that, this police officer had a bulletproof vest on. And so he thought to himself, well, here's what I can do. I'm going to draw my gun and I might take a couple of rounds to the chest. But I have confidence that this vest stops bullets. And sure enough, that's what happened. He took a couple of rounds to the chest, but he was able to get his gun and take out the bad guy. 
And so I think this illustrates um, what I hope, <laughs> nothing in terms of real bullets and shooting, but I, uh, what I illustrates what I hope to be um, something that we can pass on to the younger generations. And that is the confidence that, that young students, uh, uh, young believers have in their faith could be a bulletproof type of faith. Meaning that they can be confident that their faith can withstand the attacks from the culture. Again, not actual bullets, but I'm talking about the attacks from false ideas, from relativism, from uh, all the gender ideology that's going on, all the stuff that we see today in our culture. These are attacks leveled at the Christian worldview. And uh, I want to be able to be a part of training young believers to have, as I said, a bulletproof faith. And so in our time together this afternoon, what I want to do is outline um, a practical model that those of us who are in any kind of leadership can provide young believers. And by leadership, I mean pastors, teachers, any kind of uh, like a Sunday school teacher, or especially parents, which perhaps many of you are. I know I'm, I'm a parent. I have a 16-year-old son and a 14-year-old girl. And so um, these kinds of questions are questions that I'm uh, wrestling with on a, on a regular basis. The problem is, is that young believers are routinely walking away from their faith, all right? And all of the data that we have on this particular question all shows the same thing. No matter who is doing the investigation, every single um, study that comes out says that anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of students who grow up as young believers leave their faith when they get to high school, I'm sorry, when they get to college, okay? But I want you to understand, they are only physically leaving the church in college, but they are intellectually leaving the church oftentimes in junior high and high school. It's just that they're forced to live with their parents for the remaining few years, and when they go off to college, then they're not under the um, kind of umbrella of their parents. And so consequently, they think, all right, well, now that I don't have to go to church anymore or whatever and play that game, I'm out of here, okay? Now, a, a certain percentage of those students do eventually return back to church, okay? So we estimate, based on, this, on the data, that a third of those students who do walk away from their faith in college do come back to church, but not for the reason that we want, okay? They often come back because... They think it's just a family tradition to go to church or they now have gotten married, they have kids, and they want their kids to grow up with sort of good morality, if you will. And so the church will teach them that good morality. But the bottom line here is these people come back damaged, not actually believing Christianity is true in the way that we would often think that Christianity is true. Rather, they're just thinking it's a personal opinion. And so what I want to try to do for a minute here is explain why that departure from the church is happening. And I want to do that by explaining to you who is waiting for your kids. Now, the examples I'm going to be giving are typically college professors, but I want you to understand that even if they're in college, these types of ideas represented by these people I'm going to show you their ideas are also prevalent in now K through 12, okay? So elementary, junior high, and high school as well. And even though maybe some of these professors are no longer teaching at these universities, I guarantee you their ideas are still the dominant ideas in most of secular education, all right? So who is waiting for your kids when you send them off to a university or to college or just leaving the protective environment of your home? Well, here's one kind of guy, John Dominic Crossan. John Dominic Crossan uh, is from uh, DePaul University. He was the co-founder of what's known as the Jesus Seminar. Now, the Jesus Seminar is a group of dozens of people who claim to be scholars, and many of them are scholars, but they claim to be experts in Jesus studies. And usually around Christmas, but especially just before Easter, the people who belong to the Jesus Seminar are quoted in major newspapers and TV shows. Why? Because they deny every essential doctrine of, Christian, of our Christian faith, especially about Jesus, when it comes to what they think. And so that's why I people love to quote him. So John Dominic Crossan, again, purports to be a Christian. 
says this. After the crucifixion, Jesus' corpse was probably laid in a shallow grave, covered with dirt, and subsequently eaten by wild dogs. The story of Jesus' entombment and resurrection was the result of wishful thinking. This kind of idea is very, very prevalent at the university level. So John Dominic Crossan is one kind of person who's waiting for your kids. Peter Singer, who is an Australian um, bioethicist, although he teaches at Princeton University, um, he's considered to be one of the top 10 most influential uh, Australians in uh, the world. Um, he's an atheist. He's a human rights activist. And listen to what he says. Human babies are not born self-aware or capable of grasping that they exist over time. They are not persons. Therefore, the life of a newborn is of less value than the life of a pig, a dog, or a chimpanzee. All right? Now, of course, you'd imagine this guy does not support the pro-life view. He's definitely a, a diehard abortion rights act activist. But he's more than just defending abortion rights. This guy believes that even born children... Born children, for up to a month or two after they're born, if they have some sort of developmental handicap, they can be killed so long as it brings more happiness to kill a disabled infant and then have another infant, by the parents, who is not disabled. If that brings more happiness overall, then it justifies killing that born infant. All right? Now again, remember, this is not some obscure professor working in the basement of a no-name no university, okay? This guy chaired the Department of Philosophy at Princeton University, okay? Super influential on a worldwide scale, okay? So I don't want you to think that I'm just finding these obscure people who have no influence, right? Richard Dawkins, perhaps the most famous atheist in the world today. He's a British evolutionist, uh, of course an atheist, and this guy, <laughs> he, he does not like anyone religious. He definitely doesn't like Muslims, and he definitely doesn't like Christians. And on his definition of faith, he says, it is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is belief in spite of, even perhaps because of, the lack of evidence. So on his view, when he encounters Christians, these are people who simply believe things that are contrary to evidence, contrary to reason, okay? Because that's, that's the definition of faith that he's operating on. And Dawkins has written numerous books that are incredibly popular worldwide, all right? And even though your kid may never run into Richard Dawkins, I can guarantee you they will run across his ideas. Ibram Kendi who has become extremely popular in the last couple of years, especially because our culture has been debating race, and uh, you've probably heard of critical race theory and all these ideas. He wrote the book, um, How to Be Anti-Racist. Okay, How to Be Anti-Racist. He's the director for the Center of um, Anti-Racist anti Research at Boston University. He also uh, does a class at Harvard University. I mean, this guy's interviewed all the time whenever there's any discussion about race happening anywhere. And here's what he says. There is no neutrality in the racism struggle. The opposite of racist isn't not racist. It's anti-racist. There is no in-between safe space of not racist. The claim of not racist neutrality is a mask for racism. The language of colorblindness, like the language of not racist, is also a mask to hide racism. In other words, if you say, wait, 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 no, Alan, I, I'm not racist. You know, I, I don't see color. I just, you know, I'm colorblind. Like, it doesn't matter if someone's black or brown or whatever. Those claims that you're making, he says, are evidence that you are racist. Because there is no, I'm not racist. You're either against racism, meaning you're doing social justice activities to overturn racism, or you're racist. That's the only, only two options. Okay. And, of course, he you know, goes and speaks at churches all the time, interviewed at churches, and you know, he claims, as he says here, I cannot disconnect my parents' religious strivings to be Christian from my secular strivings to be anti-racist. Ibram Kendi is another person who's waiting for your kids at school. 
Daniel Dennett, who uh, along with Richard Dawkins and um, Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens were known as the four horsemen of the new atheists. Um, he was at Tufts University. He says, they will see me as just another liberal professor trying to cajole them out of some of their convictions. And they're dead right about that. That's what I am, and that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> okay, so these guys don't even make any, you know, try to hide the fact that they're trying to do this. They uh, not only believe it, but they're outspoken about it. Elizabeth uh, Bartholet, she's a professor also at Harvard University at the law school, and she is a vocal critic of homeschooling. And she says there is a strong connection between homeschooling and maltreatment. Listen to what she says. Parents can now keep their children at home in the name of homeschooling, free from any real scrutiny. Parents can choose to teach that biblical truth trumps all, that all science is false science, that women should be educated to be subservient to men, that people of color are inferior to whites, that people with non-traditional sexual orientations or gender identities should be cured or condemned. Parents can choose to put their children to work, notwithstanding child labor laws. Parents can choose to beat their children, to starve them, or chain them up. You can imagine a person who thinks that this is what homeschooling entails, the type of activism she's doing to try to undo homeschooling in the United States. I'm not saying you have to homeschool, by the way. I do, I do homeschool, but I'm not saying that that's the only option. But I'm just saying a person with this attitude towards homeschooling obviously is going to be a vocal opponent against many things that we as Christians do. Richard Rorty, who also taught at Princeton University, um, his ideas are incredibly influential on the campus today. Listen to what he writes. We try to arrange things so that students who enter as bigoted, homophobic, religious fundamentalists will leave college with views more like our own. He says, so we're going to go right on trying to discredit you, meaning the parents, in the eyes of your children. Trying to strip your, meaning your parents, fundamentalist religious community of dignity, trying to make your views seem silly rather than discussable. Right? They're not interested in engaging in debate about this stuff. They're just going to dismiss you, censor you, shut you down, because that's the uh, operation today. So this is just an example of the kinds of people who are waiting for your kids. And so you could understand why unless... We're preparing them to meet these challenges at the university. They're going to have a hard time. And this is nothing to say of the peer pressure that students face to swear, steal, smoke, or have sex that is just combined with the intellectual challenges that they face, right? So these kinds of temptations to engage in these behaviors slowly erode at their conscience while their will is being intellectually challenged by those uh, professors. And so my question again is, are your students or your, your children or the kids at this church, are these young believers, are they ready? Well, I've already hinted at the fact that the answer is, you know, for the most part, no. I'm not saying every child is not ready. But we do see a lot of students who are not ready. And I want to kind of figure out, well, why is that the case? Now, again, as I said, there are so many studies that have been done on this question, and I'm not going to unpack them all, but I'll just highlight uh, one of them that has become uh, very well known is by a guy named Christian Smith who did a, uh, a paper, or, I'm sorry, a study called Soul Searching, which was later published as a book with the same title. And uh, what he discovered is that when he went and interviewed thousands of teens around the country, that teens, teen believers— were incredibly inarticulate about their faith. All right? Let me just show you uh, this video of him unpacking this. There are evangelical teenagers who don't understand much about their faith and who are pretty, uh, by their own tradition standards, pretty lame. Teens could be articulate, uh, but when it came to their religious faith, beliefs. Uh, most were uh, totally at sea. Uh, they couldn't articulate hardly anything that they believed. Again, it just seemed to be uh, something they took for granted. It was just in the background. And for some teenagers, our questions about, you know, what, what are your religious beliefs seemed to be the first time that any adult had ever asked them, 
What do you believe? My name is Michaela Page. I am 16. I'm in the 10th grade, and I live in Nampa, Idaho. I grew up in the Nampa First Church of the Nazarene my whole entire life. I started from when I was a baby until now. I think I have a really good relationship with God. I, I pray with Him every single morning on the way to school. I, I try to do my devotions every single day. It's really hard because, you know, it's your life. You have a job. You have school. Things, sometimes you get tired and you just want to go to bed. It's not like He requires. He just would like us to follow Him, follow in His footsteps, do the right thing. But everybody's going to make a mistake. But that's what the good thing about God is, is you can ask for forgiveness and He'll forgive you right then and there. I think, I don't know, um, I, I don't really know. So again, this is just, uh, you know, one example amongst many. Um, what we're finding is you have the combination of two very unfortunate things. Number one is inarticulate, uninformed Christian teenagers combined with a secular, hostile, aggressive college campus. And so what's going to be the result? Well, obviously, young believers are going to walk away from their faith. That's the problem. Now, a lot of these studies ask them and try to investigate, well, what were the things that led you to reject your faith? Okay? In other words, why did you fall away from the faith in which you're raised? The number one answer that accounted for 32% of all the answers was intellectual skepticism or doubt. And so students said things like, well, it just didn't make any sense anymore to me. Or some stuff is too far-fetched for me to believe. Uh, some people said, I think scientifically, and there is no real proof from the scientific realm. Or there's just too many questions that cannot be answered. Right? Again, all of this stuff boiled down to what they discovered was just intellectual skepticism and doubt. Again, combined with a secular, aggressive, hostile culture. Uh, combined with the behavioral temptations to engage in, you know, moral, morally illicit acts. And so how do we then solve this problem? Well, I'm going to say something that's going to sound controversial at first, but hear me out, okay? We need to stop teaching, okay, and instead start training. Now, if you're a teacher, don't jump at me here just a minute. Uh, I'm not saying teaching is bad. Absolutely, teaching is essential, all right? Um, what a, how I'm defining teaching here is simply about imparting information, which, again, is absolutely essential. But when I say we need to stop teaching and start training is, I mean, we need to do more than just impart information. We actually have to train young believers for battle because that's what they're facing, right? The Bible has uh, all kinds of uh, metaphors, you know, metaphors talking about war and spiritual battle because that's what it actually is. And so what I want to do is uh, teach you a, a five-step sort of model for um, uh, how we can raise young believers to be prepared for the battle that they undoubtedly will experience. And we're going to use the word train as an acronym to unpack each of these particular uh, components, okay? So the, the T stands for test. And what I mean by this is we need to... Uh, test our students. We need to challenge our students to see where they are weak. Find out what their weakness is so that the enemy doesn't exploit that weakness at a later time, right? And by the way, this is no different than what educators do all the time, right? Schools will have typically like placement exams that students will have to take to say, oh, okay, I see. This is where you're at at English or math, and they'll place them at a certain level, right? And so based on the score, that's where you discover where you begin your training. And I think we should do the same thing when it comes to students and young believers' uh, spiritual levels as well. Now, there's many different ways to test. I know, of course, there's traditional testing, like just using an exam, you know, multiple choice or essay or whatever. Like, of course, that's the way to do it, one way to do it. I like to take a different approach. And the way I like to test students is by engaging in what's called role play. And by role play, what I mean is I'm oftentimes introduced 
uh, by, uh, by the host as not a Christian. So sometimes it might be an atheist, sometimes it might be as a Muslim, right? And so the students don't know that I'm actually a Christian, but I'm introduced as somebody else. And then I will attempt to role play whoever it is I'm trying to impersonate to see how the students engage with what they believe to be an actual Muslim or an actual atheist or an actual Mormon, all right? I'll just show a quick video of... Hello, Akbar. The Bellman Ahmed Mother. My name is Saeed Ibn Mar, and uh, I'm a Muslim, as uh, your friend here, Brett, your teacher, uh, has, has mentioned. And it's a pleasure for me to come to a uh, Christian school and to be able to speak with Christians. Uh, you know, in, in, our, in our culture, this, uh, what they call post-9-11, it's uh, becoming increasingly difficult to have uh, civilized conversations with, uh, with Christians. And for me, as a Muslim, I find myself more and more uh, marginalized in a country which allegedly claims to be about tolerance and diversity. That's true. And I think you said quite accurately that there are many characteristics that we can put onto what God is like. And that's precisely what we have seen that has happened here in, in what you say is the Bible, right? You have added on these ideas, these things like trinities, right? You say, uh, we can speak to the Father, and He is God. And then we can speak to this Holy Spirit force, that He is God. And we can come and speak to this Jesus, and He is God. And this is a very interesting idea, which I believe that Quran has clarified. And this is one of the things I was referring to, and that is that uh, although we as Muslims believe that Allah did reveal divine revelation to Jesus, peace be upon Him, uh, who is a prophet of Allah, that that material has been corrupted. Man's wisdom has mixed in with God's wisdom, and now we don't know what exactly are the true remaining words of Allah in here. And this is precisely why we needed the Quran to be clarified and to supersede what has been written before. So, anyways, this, I go on, and so you notice I'm engaging the students, pretending I'm a Muslim, telling them, look, your Bible's corrupted. Right? That's why we needed the Quran to come and to, to clarify the truth. You, know? you guys believe in three gods. You know, Jesus is God, the Father is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Don't believe in three gods. And so the students then, once I do kind of an introduction to my ideas, now they start asking questions. Well, wait a minute. You know? And they try to defend their ideas. Okay? And so what I'm doing here is I'm exposing them to a hostile worldview but in a safe environment, because, I don't know if I didn't mention this, but at the end, I say, okay, guess what? I'm just kidding. I'm not, I'm not a Muslim. I'm a Christian. They're like, what? You know? But what it, it allows me to do is to see how these students are going to respond to what they perceive as a Muslim or an atheist or a Mormon. Okay? Uh, also, it sometimes allows me to see whether they're going to be gracious in terms of how they engage Muslims or atheists or Mormons. Because sometimes... They fly off the handle. They call me names and whatever. And, and so um, it allows them to see, oh, man, I let my, my temper, my anger get the best of me in that, in, in, in that engagement. But ultimately what it does is it creates a desire to learn because oftentimes these students do a horrible job of engaging someone who, again, I'm just role-playing an atheist or Mormon or uh, a Muslim. And so now that they've experienced that, they're like, okay, you're right. Yeah, we had no idea how to respond to Saeed, you know, this alleged Muslim. All right, like, okay, well, what do we got to know about Islam? And so this is the way that I am able to test them to see where they're at. Okay. So that's the T. Um, we also want to go to the R in train, and that's to require. And by require, I mean we want to expect more from our students than we, th than, than we think that they can handle, all right? And what I mean by this is we need to elevate our expectations because too often a lot of youth programs entail, you know, pizza parties, video games, doing fun stuff, which, again, don't get me wrong, I'm not against having fun, all right? I, <laughs> I absolutely think we should do things that are fun. But what we don't realize is that they can handle a lot more when we expect more of them. Uh, Gabrielle mentioned this as a, um, a commentary about how she felt about her youth programs when she was in high school, now that she's in college. Listen to what she said. I was in several youth groups in high school and unfortunately found that youth group was too soft. We played a lot of games, we had a lot of fun retreats, but rarely learned about the fundamentals of the faith, why, believe, why we believe what we believe, and what it is that we do believe. Now that I'm in college... 
my faith is under constant scrutiny and always being tested by scientific concepts and the secular slant of the university. I wish I had been equipped with more solid justification for my faith, knowing how to answer the tough questions, how to respond to arguments, and how to stand firm in what feels like a storm against my spirituality. Okay? Again, just one example of many people who share a similar kind of story. And the crazy thing is, when it comes to academics, we require more for academics all the time. We expect so much out of students, right? And when they, um, when they don't succeed, we hire tutors. We hold them accountable. We're, we're pushing them, right? When it comes to sports, same thing, right? We have them practice before school, after school, on the weekends, right? Uh, we have coaches. We push them. All I'm simply saying is, why don't we expect more when it comes to their, their faith, to their spirituality, to their understanding of what they believe and why they believe it? Now, the A in train stands for arm. And what I mean by that is we need to provide students then with truth and teach them how to articulate that truth. All right? Again, going back to the you know, war metaphor here, any soldier, any police officer, any person who's going into combat, they have to be properly armed. All right? Now, since this is spiritual warfare and not physical warfare, um, that means we have to arm them with the weapons that are appropriate for the type of warfare they're going to be engaged in. Now, I believe this entails training or arming of two kinds of things. Number one is knowledge of the truth, but also knowledge of the error. And I believe both of these are essential. So let's take each one in turn. All right? First of all, we have to teach them to be, we need to arm them with knowledge of the truth. And what I mean by that is we have to equip them with the foundations of what Scripture teaches, right? The Bible, which is, of course, the obvious thing. Right, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, Paul says, Stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter. Now, the, the word traditions there, that's translated in English, um, comes from the, the Greek word, uh, paradosis, which does not mean traditions like, you know, we think of like, like Thanksgiving dinner is always cranberry, okay? That's a traditional kind of, that's not what he means by tradition. Tradition in, in that Greek word refers to a distinct body of knowledge that Paul received and then is now passing on, right, either by his verbal communication or by his writing, okay? And so we need to arm our young believers in understanding Scripture, and what, what, they, what, what it says. What is God's message? Now, they don't have to be theologians, right? But they can't know nothing. <laughs> they got to understand the gospel and the main thrust of Scripture, all right? But as we're learning, it's not just enough to know what they believe. We also want them to know why they believe what they believe. And this has to do with the field of apologetics, Okay. Uh, Rick appropriately uh, defined apologetics for us earlier, coming from the Greek word apologia, which means reason or defense. Okay? So apologetics is simply a branch of theology that deals with giving reasons why we believe what we believe. All right? um, there are a number of great organizations that are involved in apologetics. I'm just going to mention three of them. Uh, that I'm closely affiliated with. Obviously, I work for Stand to Reason, so I highly recommend our website, str.org. Uh, we have th literally thousands of free articles, podcasts, and if you go to our YouTube channel, which you can find through our website, um, but we have uh, videos on YouTube answering questions of all sorts, ethics, evolution, homosexuality, gender stuff, race, you name it. That's what we do, and we try to provide all of it for free. I mean, I guess if you buy a book, you have to pay for it. But, I mean, the vast majority of what we offer is free content. Uh, Jay Warner Wallace is a friend of mine who I mentioned is a retired um, homicide detective. He's the guy who told me the story about the police officer involved shooting. But his website is coldcasechristianity.com, right? It is also an excellent website. He's got an incredible amount of free resources specifically focused on Jesus, the New Testament, the resurrection. It, it's amazing. So I highly recommend that website as well. 
Uh, William Lane Craig, his website's reasonablefaith.org. William Lane Craig might arguably be the top Christian debater on earth. This guy goes to various countries and debates the top atheists in those countries and wins. In fact, there's websites created by atheists who are saying, how is it that William Lane Craig keeps winning? How do we defeat William Lane Craig? Because he'll often give the same five arguments for God's existence to all these top atheists. So everybody knows what his argument is ahead of time. And yet they still can't really defeat his arguments. He challenged uh, Richard Dawkins, the most famous atheist in the world, to a debate. Richard Dawkins refused. Why? Because he would be demolished by William Lane Craig. I'm not just saying that because I'm on his side. He is an exceptional debater. Anyways, his website, reasonablefaith.org, is divided into two sections. He's got a section which is called the scholarly section, and he's got a section that's like the popular level section. The scholarly section is where you, he's speaking in his, in his professional mode of like talking like philosophically, very, very, um, very academic, very intellectual, very rigorous type of stuff. And so if you're bent towards that or you know people who are, you'd send them over to the area that says scholarly work. The other section where I typically spend most of my time is where it says popular level work, which is where he gives, you know, the regular kinds of arguments that you might hear you know, at church or wherever, okay? And uh, so that way, it's geared towards whatever bent a person happens to be with regards to how much they can handle intellectually. So I highly recommend that website as well. Again, there are many others, but these are just three that, um, you know, because I know all these people, um, I definitely recommend them. If you want to get started in your um, learning of apologetics, and I know, uh, Rick, you do a lot of um, training here also on apologetics, right? So... All right, but knowledge of the truth is not enough. Yes, we need to know the truth, but I want to also argue that we have to have knowledge of the error, of the false ideas that are raised up against the truth of God, and they're trying to attack it. And the scriptures teach us two reasons why we need to have knowledge of the truth. The first is so that we do not fall prey to those false ideas. Colossians here says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. All right? So we want to know the false ideas so that we spot them before we ingest them and make them a part of our thinking. And the second reason the scripture teaches us that we need to know false ideas is so that we can destroy false ideas. I know that doesn't sound very politically correct. But look, the Bible says the weapons we fight with have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Okay? So those, this is why we need to know false ideas, not just the truth. And um, great Jesh, J. Gresham Machen, uh, the uh, great uh, Presbyterian scholar, writing, I think, like exactly 100 years ago, said this about the impact of false ideas if we allow false ideas to continue to perpetuate in our culture. Listen to what he said. He said, false ideas are the greatest obstacles to the gospel. We might preach with all the fervor of a reformer and yet succeed only in winning a straggler here and there if we permit the whole collective thought of the nation or of the world to be controlled by ideas which prevent Christianity from being regarded as anything more than a harmless delusion. In other words, if we allow the people around us or our culture to believe false ideas that lead people to think, oh, Christians, Psh, man, they're so deluded. They believe all kinds of ridiculous things. If we allow our culture to believe those false ideas, this will hamper our ability to reach people with the gospel. Okay, that's, that's in a nutshell what he's saying. Now, there are two ways to address false ideas. The right way and the wrong way, <laughs> okay? Here is the wrong way to address false ideas, which sadly we as a church have done, I'm not saying you, this church, but the global church, often has done when it comes to false ideas. Here's what we do. We ignore false ideas, right? We ridicule false ideas. We don't teach people why 
others are persuaded by false ideas, and instead we just simply throw Bible verses at false ideas. And all this does is it leads people to become isolated from false ideas, which we think is the right thing. It's like, oh, let's shelter young believers, you know, from these false ideas because we don't want them to believe them. This is extremely dangerous. Um, just take evolution, for example. And when I say evolution, I mean naturalistic evolution, meaning non-God-guided process of evolution, okay? When it comes to evolution, you know what we've typically done? we followed this methodology. We typically ignore evolution. We don't define evolution. We don't teach people why people are persuaded to believe in evolution. And instead, we just simply make fun of it. Oh, evolution's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. My grandfather wasn't an orangutan or a chimpanzee, you know. And actually, the Bible says, you know, the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. You know, this is just foolishness, you know. As if saying that Bible verse will magically make the problem of evolution go away. And so when we do this with young believers, here's what happens. They become isolated from the false idea. They go off to university, and guess what? They meet a real evolutionist, perhaps their friend, perhaps their boyfriend or girlfriend. And when they discover that your son or daughter is an evolutionist, they say, oh, I mean, and discover that you don't believe in evolution. They're like, you don't believe in evolution? <laughs> oh my gosh, you're ridiculous. How crazy is that? Here, I have three evidences for why evolution is true. And the young believer's like, what? You have evidence? Oh, yeah, yeah, I got scientific evidence, I got philosophical evidence, I got genetic And the young believer is completely caught off guard, right? Because they've never heard of this evidence. They've never heard why people believe in evolution. They haven't even had a proper definition of evolution. Forget about that young believer having any impact for the cause of Christ. Let's just hope they survive with their faith intact. Why? Because they were isolated. So, the solution then is not to isolate. Rather, it's to inoculate. Okay? We need to inoculate believers to false ideas. Now, what do I mean by inoculate? Okay? Um, okay, think of a disease. Not COVID, because I'm, I'm so tired of talking about COVID. Okay. Let's talk about polio, okay? Polio is a disease, all right? If you want to get inoculated to polio, and you go to your doctor, say, can I have a polio vaccine? To give you a polio vaccine, I forgot if it's a shot or it's a... Do you drink it? I forgot. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, do you know what's in the polio vaccine? Does anyone know? Yeah, polio. Actual polio strain is found in the polio vaccine. Why? Because when you ingest it or take it into your body, your body says, wait a minute, what is this thing that just came into my body? And then it creates an immune response. It creates antibodies that are tailored specifically to destroy the polio virus. That way, when you go off to some other place and you get exposed to the real polio virus, your body says, oh, I know what this is. I've seen it before. And guess what? Here is my army of antibodies that is ready to destroy polio. And it does, and you don't get sick with polio. My suggestion is we need to take that same approach when it comes to false ideas. We need to teach false ideas enough so that young believers understand what is the false idea, what is the definition, what are the reasons why people believe these false ideas, and what is wrong with those reasons. That way, when they go off to college and they run across that evolutionist, and the evolutionist says, oh, you're a Christian? <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys cracked me up. You guys are so stupid. You don't even believe in evolution. Here are three reasons why evolution is true. But this time, the young believer says, oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard of those three reasons. In fact, let me give you two more reasons why evolution is true. But now let me tell you what's wrong with all five of them. You see, that is powerful because now the young believer understands the false idea better than the person who's advocating for it. And then, they don't just merely survive with their faith intact. They become powerful agents of change for the cause of Christ. Because we inoculated them, we didn't isolate them. Um, the new atheists that I mentioned, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, um, Sam Harris, look, it isn't a matter of if 
It's only a matter of when your students, your young believers, will come across their ideas. It's only a matter of time. Okay? They may never run into those professors. They will run into those ideas. So the question is, when do you want them to be exposed to those false ideas? When they're off alone at the university or at work or under the uh, peer pressure of another person and they've, they're now just hearing for it, about it for the first time or in the appropriate uh, safe environment of a church or your youth group or uh, your household or whatever it might be. Okay? So you can say, hey, these are the ideas. Here's why people believe them. Here's what's wrong with those ideas. And that way they go off later on, get exposed to it. They're like, hey, yeah, I've heard this. I know this. This is not, uh, not surprising to me at all. So that's what it means to arm young believers. Oh, sorry, these are the new, these are the new atheist guys that I was talking about. Christopher Hitchens actually since passed away. He died of cancer recently. But um, is Dennis still alive? I think Dennis is still alive, yeah. But anyways, again, it doesn't matter. They will run across the ideas of these professors, these guys. Okay, then the I in train stands for involve, okay? What this means is we need to deploy students to the battlefield of ideas to help solidify their understanding of those ideas and to be able to practice what they've learned, all right? Um, I live near a Marine Corps base uh, in San Diego, and a lot of my friends in the Marine Corps are always like, Alan, you know, the more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in battle. And their point is, is that the more you're able to um, practice what you know in a safe environment with, you know, your friends or with, you know, not lethal, you know, situations, uh, the less likely you are to uh, get injured when you go off to be deployed to the real battlefield, okay? And so when I say we need to involve them, I don't mean just throw them out to the wolves, right? Uh, I mean put them in progressively more challenging situations in a slow manner where you're overseeing that whole process. Let me give you a couple examples of what I'm talking about. Um, I routinely do what's called mission trips. Now, I don't mean mission trips like going to Africa to feed the homeless or whatever like that. I'm talking about apologetics mission trips, all right? So one mission trip that I routinely do is called the Muslim mission trip or the Muslim immersion. And what I do with this is I first begin by role-playing, as I showed you earlier, a Muslim to a group of students, okay? So I'll pretend I'm a Muslim. I'll expose them to what they're going to hear at a mosque or from a Muslim. So they have a heads up. Oh, okay, these are the kinds of arguments that Muslims are going to present. And I try to present it as convincingly as I can, all right? Then I also spend an, uh, a, a tremendous amount of time then unpacking what I role-played and explaining to them what are the reasons why we don't believe those things. What are some of the criticisms that are leveled at Islam? What are some of the arguments they present? How do you respond to them? But then I take them to a mosque. And I've done this both in the United States and in the Middle East, okay? But we take them to a mosque. So this is a group of, I don't know, it was like maybe 50 students. We went to a mosque. I think this was in Los Angeles. Um, but I take him to a mosque. I call up the, uh, the mosque. I say, hey, um, my name's Alan. I'm a Christian. I'd like to bring 50 Christian high school students to your mosque. Would that be okay? I shouldn't do this. Who's got phones like this anymore, right? It's more like this. Hey, I'd like to bring 50 Christian uh, high school students to your mosque. Would that be okay? They're like, sure, absolutely. I've never been turned down. And so we go there. We sit in. We watch their service. We watch their Friday prayers. We see what they're doing. Then I invite them to bring their top Muslim scholar to then give a private lecture to us, challenging us to become a Muslim. And then I have the students engage that scholar, okay, with questions and feedback and stuff like that, right? And then afterwards, oh, actually, here's, a, here's an example of one. So this guy was, uh, this is in uh, northern Los Angeles. Uh, I'll just show you a quick video of him. Um, you know, trying to make his case here. The difference comes that we see that Jesus was one prophet. Same like people before him. Same like Moses, Abraham, and so on. And same like Muhammad after him. So we see Jesus as a prophet who came after Moses and came before Muhammad in the same story of humanity on earth. Even if the Bible concentrates on some for a while for some group of people, the sons of Israel, sons of Jacob, 
and tell about some of their prophets frequently, but this doesn't exclude that there had been other prophets in other areas of the world, for other people, for other <coughs> tribes, nations, and so on. And then Prophet Muhammad came after Jesus like 550 or 600 years, and he came as a final prophet or final messenger. So God sent him as the last one in this long chain. I don't know if you noticed, but to his left there, these two women, uh, I also will often ask, I don't always get this, but I'll say, hey, do you know any people who were once Christians that have now converted to Islam? And so they'll oftentimes, you know, bring someone like that. They would say, hey, we'd love for you to share your testimony. Why did you convert from Christianity to Islam? And so then we get to have these personal stories where the students can then engage those people, right? And then after we go to that experience, we, we leave the area and then we head somewhere else and we'll do a debrief. Okay, so now I'll unpack, I'll sit with the students and we'll unpack what they heard, right? Were there any challenges raised by the Muslim scholar that you weren't able to understand or to respond to or you felt were convincing, okay? So we want to make sure that we're, we're kind of shoring up any you know, areas that need to be uh, uh, addressed, okay? But this is an example of what we do, right? Uh, I do this also with the issue of abortion and pro-life mission trips, right? I'll start off by, again, training the students in the art of pro-life persuasion. So I give them the arguments, the evidence, whatever, right? Then we have them role-play themselves, okay? So they'll practice. They'll say those, those arguments out loud. And then we go to a downtown area. This was uh, downtown Portland, okay? And I have the students use a survey where they engage just passers-by, right, uh, questions about abortion. And what that does is it provides an opportunity, a springboard, to get into a conversation about abortion where they can then practice the very skills they had learned the day before. Okay? So it's not just learning the stuff. They're actually getting involved and using it with people who, who actually disagree with them, who oftentimes vigorously disagree with them. Um, again, these are just some pictures of, of them engaging just passers-by. And you can imagine downtown Portland, man, we get some pretty interesting conversations with uh, people out there when we're saying, you know, we're, we're talking about being pro-life, right? Now, by the way, I don't just do this with other people's kids, okay? I do this with my own kids, all right? Here's an example. This is uh, the campus of UCLA. UCLA, if you don't probably know it, right? It's a, um, you probably do know, but it's a, a very large secular campus in Los Angeles, Okay. And uh, I knew of a abortion exhibit or a protest against abortion that was going to be set up. It's right here. These are huge billboard-sized images of graphic, uh, graphically showing what abortion does to the unborn. I, they're not all on this side. A lot of the bad ones are on the other side because we didn't want them to be in the picture here. But it's very, very graphic. And as you can imagine, this is like right in the middle of UCLA's campus. It's, um, it's incredible, right? So people see this and get all upset. They start to walk up there. And so I typically will go to these protests because I like to stand in the crowd and just be standing shoulder to shoulder next to somebody as they're looking at this. And I turn to them and say, hey, you know, what do you think of that? And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm in a conversation about abortion. And so then I can engage them, right? So my son, at when he was 10 years old, was like, Dad, hey, can I come with you? You know, you always go to these things. Can I come with you? I'm like, well, son, I don't know if a college, uh, university campus is the right place for a 10-year-old when uh, something like this is showing up. He's like, oh, come on, Dad. Uh, you, you always talk about, you know, uh, inoculation. Let's go. Let's do it. I'm like, all right. So I, I trained my son in the art of pro-life persuasion. I trained him in all the arguments that I could think of, all the responses, what he's going to hear, and so on and so forth, right? Then, I, this is my son here. His name is Nathan. That was when he was 10. You can see the kendama. Kendamas aren't popular anymore, but they were at that time. He's now 16. But so notice what I'm doing first. I've taught him all of the, 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 the art of pro-life persuasion. Now I'm modeling for him as I engage these two abortion choice advocate students. So he's hearing me actually perform the, uh, the tactics that I taught him the day before. Okay? Then I slowly begin to integrate him into a other conversation. So here's another abortion choice advocate student. And I heard this student say something, and I turned to my son, I'm like, hey, Nathan, what do you think about what this guy just said? And he's like, oh, and so he'll try to give a response, right? So I notice I'm progressively increasing his involvement, right? By the end of the day, he was walking up. There was this, um, this little uh, poll, should abortion remain legal? And people can come and sign their names, yes or no, okay? 
So you'd see students walk up. And so as students would walk up and sign what they thought was the answer, my son would come up and then ask them, hey, why did you say yes or why did you say no? You know, here he is engaging this other guy, right, about abortion. Now, I'm not saying he convinced anybody or was like, you know, he's not, he's not an Einstein. He's just a normal kid, right? But the point I'm trying to show you is that I'm involving him in progressively more uh, significant ways with the material that I'm teaching him. Now, after he has his experience, do you think he's got confidence to share his convictions about abortion when it comes to his friends or his family? <laughs> Absolutely, right? He's just did it with people twice his age, complete strangers. And so for him to be like, you know, when grandma is like, hey, you know, um, Nathan, you shouldn't, you know, think that abortion's a bad thing. It's sometimes it's a good thing. And my son's like, well, no, it's not, grandma. Why would you say that? And he starts engaging with her, you know. Why? Because he's done it with complete strangers twice his age. Now, I'm not trying to say if you have a 10-year-old, you should do this. It's not my point, okay? All of us who are parents understand our children better than anybody else. And we can make good decisions about age-appropriate ways to get them involved. So my point isn't throw your 10-year-old on a university campus, okay? That's not my point at all. I'm just trying to give you an example of how I progressively involve him in more significant ways, all right? And this is the power of involving students in real-life engagement, okay? Because the more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in battle. Now, I don't believe that these mission trips are the only way to involve your students. There's many other ways. For example, reading a book written by an author who holds to a different view. Like Richard Dawkins, he's got tons of books, you know. Uh, the God Delusion, for example, is a great book to just pick up. You read it yourself, and you say, hey, son or daughter, why don't we read this together chapter by chapter once a month and discuss it, all right? Uh, watching movies, right? Virtually every movie out there has a message, right? And a lot of these messages are hostile to the Christian worldview. I mean, even Star Wars. I mean, Star Wars is basically, I mean, th there is a good thing in that there is good and evil that's clearly defined, but it promotes pantheism, the idea that the universe and everything in it are all in one. Like God and the universe are just one and the same, which is a completely hostile view towards Christianity. So it's good to see this stuff uh, with your young son or daughter and then process it with them, right? Um, there's a movie called The Island, okay? You know, uh, big budget Hollywood blockbuster film. It's got uh, Scarlett Johansson and Ewan McGregor, who are two, like, you know, A-list actors, actresses, right? Uh, Michael Bay directed it, you know, amazing movie, but it brings up the subject of cloning. Is cloning morally permissible or not? Now, the movie presupposes that we are just physical beings, okay, which of course is not biblical, but it does make the case or the argument that cloning people would be a bad thing. It's rather interesting. So it's got both good and, and bad parts. Same with Star Wars. Same with virtually every movie. So why not be intentional about how to involve your kids in watching a movie and analyzing these movies to see what's good, what's bad, being able to recognize these messages because that's all they're going to be hearing for the rest of their lives. So there's, again, more ways to involve your students than just simply, you know, putting them on a campus, taking them to a mosque, having them, uh, you know, approach abortion choice advocates in downtown Portland. Okay, <laughs> That's not my point. It's just we need to involve them. And then the final thing is N, which is nurture. Um, what this means is we need to tend to students' wounds and model Christ-like engagement. And so this is a couple things here that are involved. First of all, we have to realize that whether they have success or failure, both of those results will end up creating some wounds, okay? And so we have to be aware of that. That's normal. It's expected. We can't expect they're going to go through life and never be wounded, so instead, anticipate the wounds and be ready to be there for them afterwards to, to nurture and to tend to their wounds. And that's why I will always, after a role play or a mission trip or any kind of like, you know, we watched a movie, I want to debrief. Like, hey, what did you think about that? You know, what, what's, what questions are in your mind right now? I want to be there for them to help them process that. So, um, what are you then doing to keep young believers from leaving their faith, right? Um, we've, we've 
try to unpack a number of different things, but I believe that that question mistakenly presumes that it's the church's job to um, train and to prepare young believers for the world that they're in. And I think that's a mistaken presumption. Okay? Yes, the church should do what it can, but you as parents, for those of you who are parents, have an incredible responsibility and an incredible opportunity to be the ones who nurture and model Christ-like behavior and do that kind of training. Okay? So I think we often make the mistake of assuming somebody else needs to do this for us. We just need to get our kids in that environment. Yes, that should happen to the, to the degree that it can. But if you're a parent, man, you have a great opportunity to be a huge, huge influence in the lives of young believers. In fact, we've looked at the impact on a student based on various kinds of training. So, you know, you bring in a speaker. Yeah, that's going to have a certain amount of impact in the student's life. No doubt about it, right? You um, attend a, have your student attend a conference. Yeah, it's going to be a greater impact because there's emotion, there's excitement, there's energy, and so on and so forth, right? You um, have, say, the youth leadership uh, do regularly regular training on apologetics and worldview on a regular basis, that's going to have also a huge, huge impact. But man, if you can model as parents a reasonable, evidential faith every day in your, in your homes, that kind of impact is going to go through the roof. Right? I truly believe that as parents, we have a huge opportunity to do a lot of good for our kids. The challenge is, is are we able to do it? You know, And that's why what I'm hoping you'll walk away from this talk realizing is you need to be the one who takes um, leadership with learning this stuff so that you can then turn around and engage your students with it. Now, um, we have, um, yeah, so to train, sorry, test, require, arm, involve, and nurture. Um, you saw earlier I mentioned about conferences and how conferences can be a huge uh, benefit. Um, we actually at Standard Reason produce a student conference, and we teach it or provide it at six locations around the country. It just so happens that the Dallas-Fort Worth area is one of those places where we host the conference every year. And it's called the Reality Student Apologetics Conference. Um, every year we have a different theme. This year, which we have just kicked off the season in California, our theme is Chaos to Clarity. Okay, So it's talking about how we live in a chaotic culture, but we want to direct people to the clarity found in Scripture and in Christianity. So let me just show you a quick one-minute video clip uh, that's like a promo video for the conference that will be coming to Allen, Texas, which, I don't know, how far is that from here? 30 minutes left? 45 minutes? Okay, yeah. Let's take a look. Your world is changing. Everything you once knew is being redefined. in that way. The answer to guilt is not denial. That's relativism. The answer to guilt is forgiveness. But our culture tells us, no, don't put your identity in Jesus. Put your identity in your political party. Put your identity in your ethnic group. Or put your identity in your sexual preference. But don't you dare put your identity in Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, you were created to know him and to make him known. So I, this is probably the largest student apologetics conference that happens around the country. We had um, we just had our first one last week. We had 2,000 students. We had to we had to cap it at that. Uh, we you know some of them go up to 3,000. Uh, I don't know what uh, this is gonna be a con with Creek Church. I don't know what the total uh, sign up will be for that, but it'll be at least a thousand or two thousand. So it's just it is a great time. It's high energy. It's a lot of fun, and we um, bring in the top speakers on the topics that we address. So, um, you know, we're not 
you know, we're, we're, you know, I and a few other people handpick the people who are going to be teaching because we, we want the absolute best. And uh, we're privileged to, to be friends with a lot of these people, so we're able to bring these people in. So I encourage you to consider that. Reality Apologetics is the, uh, the website, although if you go to our own website, str.org, you'll, you'll see um, links at some place uh, for Reality Apologetics. Okay. Um, all right, any questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, uh, anything that I can clarify? Uh, I'm, I can, I'm happy to answer. Yes. Oh, we have a microphone. Look at that. Even better. My son is 39 years old. And <coughs> when I was raising him, my husband wasn't a believer. So I had to assume the role of both parents spiritually. Yeah. Um, not knowing how it would affect him, I really believe God directed my steps as the spiritual head of my household. And uh, abortion, among other discussions, were always at the forefront of mm. a lot of our discussion. Yeah. I'm very pro-life. My father did not want me. My mother was pregnant with me. He beat mm. her to a pulp day wow. after day, hoping I would die. Wow. God had a purpose for me. Yeah. And uh, my son, I got pregnant with him when I was 19. I was not married. Um, my family wanted me to abort. But God had his hand on my son. And so abortion has always been a huge topic. Yeah. And I'm passionate about it, very passionate, because of what I went through, what my, my son lived through with us, you know, parenting yeah. him when we weren't ready, but God was there. And so through the discussions that we had about abortion, um, I always wondered, am I beating him over the head with this too much? I wound up taking a job at CCU in Fort Worth, Texas Christian University, which yeah. is very not <laughs> Christian. Yeah, yeah. Um, the way that it was founded um, is not what it is today. And um, I was working in scholarships and financial aid, just support positions, secretary positions is what I had done. And um, one of my favorite financial aid students came in, and she was – a graduate student working on her master's. And so she came up to me and said, I am so proud of your son. They had brought in a group of people from Planned Parenthood mm. to talk about, you know, yeah. <laughs> anti-abortionists yep. and how they need to view abortion, yeah. you know. And she said, your son stood up and he told on a few people. <laughs> wow. And I <coughs> was like, thank you, Lord. Mm you know, for the opportunity to do that and that he now as a husband and a father yeah. can raise his children yeah. to have that knowledge. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of people mistake book knowledge with real life lesson mm -hmm. knowledge. Yeah. And, um, you know, it to prepare our kids is so important yeah. because, you know, I worked at CCU for seven years. I transferred from financial aid to the School of Music. Yeah. So that's when I met my first transgender student before sure. transgenderism is what it is today. Yeah. It was in the early 2000s. And wow. um, I learned a lot being in that environment. Yeah. Yeah. But it strengthened my faith. And it has strengthened me to be able to work with young students mm -hmm. and to ask them, you know, what are you going to say when someone asks you about transgenderism or you yeah. know, homophobia yeah. or all of that. So anyway, well, you thank are you. <laughs> yeah. you're a breath of fresh air. That's well, all I can say. Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, thank you so much for being vulnerable and sharing that story. What an am amazing testimony that is. And also to the importance, as we talked about, of just being a parent who takes the lead as best we can to prepare our, our children for what they're going to face. And it's so great to hear at the, <laughs> the end of the story <laughs> to hear your son be able to defend his views on the pro-life issue like that. So wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious about your history, how you guys got started. Stand to reason. Oh, stand to reason. Well, uh, so Greg Kokel is the president of Stand to Reason. He was a pastor at um, a four-square church in Los Angeles. And um, he was invited to um, do some speaking on the radio with a guy named Dennis Prager, 
who had a TV show, I think it was a TV show, yeah, called Religion on the Line. Oh, was it TV or radio? I can't remember. Uh, it, may have been, it may have been TV form form. But anyways, uh, it was called Religion on the Line, where he had uh, a Jew, a Catholic, and a Protestant. I think a Muslim was invited too. And he, uh, so my boss was invited to be a part of that. Eventually, he started to realize that he was sort of gifted in, in, the, in the whole discussion that he was able to have and began teaching at that church and eventually said, wow, I think I want to leave my work as a pastor and start a Christian nonprofit and called Stand to Reason. That began in 1993. And then I ran a Cast Greg in 97 and then joined them in 2004. So, yeah, it's, so Greg, Greg pretty much for the most part started it, and he's still the president of it today. Good. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Is there any? Yeah. So, I mean, great uh, um, presentation today. As far as kind of building up the knowledge base to defend some of those topics, I know you shared some resources, but as you know, obviously a lot of it you kind of build up over time, right? So I don't know if there's right. any progre recommended progression officially on like scientific topics right away. And you're defending space and the right to evolution, um, as that you would recommend. Like, are there any um, kind of learning paths to go around so you can kind of build up the the defense? Well, okay. In terms of learning paths, um, so what what we recommend first of all is to kind of kickstart um, either your students' learning or your learning by attending a reality conference. And since that's coming here in that was it was it March, February. February. Oh even sooner. Um, I'd recommend uh, attending that with your, with your student. Um, and then what we recommend after that is one of our main sponsors is Summit Ministries, which is a two-week uh, uh, camp that is all based on worldview and apologetics training. And so you have a two-day conference that we provide called Reality. And then we'd recommend like a two-week camp like that or Impact 360, which is based out of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, which would be like an in, which would be sort of the next step you would take, and I think those two things would just kind of kick off uh, a tremendous amount of excitement and energy and learning in the field of apologetics. Um, now, if you just want you know information about evolution and intelligent design that kind of stuff, you might consider the Discovery Institute, which is based out of uh, I think based out of Seattle. Uh, Rick, you attended their summer institute. I've also attended their summer institute. But this organization is composed of a lot of scientists, a lot of uh, really careful thinkers that are some Christian, some not, but all advance um, some pretty aggressive views against naturalistic evolution and provide, you know, education. Um, there's, you know, you could do, um, if, if your student is still in college uh, or soon after, they can apply for a program where they spend two weeks there at their expense, they'll pay for it, uh, and they'll provide you with like top-level education uh, addressing intelligent design and, and evolution. So there's a whole bunch of resources. It just really depends on specifically what you want and what you're looking for. But does that answer your question? Or okay, yes, there are. You're right. There is a lot of resources. Yeah. So again, I mean, we can talk maybe later if you have specifics about like your your kid's age and whatever. But um, I mean, again, I try to, I would encourage you to do as much as you can at home, try to, you know, have them participate in, like, these conferences, these apologetics conferences, because those things typically have so much energy that it gets them really worked up and excited about um, not, just the, uh, not just the energy there, but the, the content that's presented, if it's presented well. And I'm, and I'm not trying to boast, but I think we do a really good job of presenting the content well at these conferences, and it might, you know, be a good spark for them. Would it, yeah, so the conference be appropriate for 13-year-olds. So yeah, we say uh, it's geared for junior high to, to the university level. So there might be some things as a junior higher you they might not fully grasp, but it's close enough. Like they'll be able to get most of it, maybe just not 100% of it, but that's okay. You know, I, uh, you know my kids have been going ever <laughs> since they're little kids uh, because I think they'll still grasp some things, and I think it's worth it. Uh, it's called the Discovery Institute. Um, th their website, do you know what it is? Or is it, dis is it discovery.org? Yeah. 
But if you just look up Discovery Institute, it's a fairly large website, and um, man, they got you know, they got all kinds of people, <laughs> and they do they produce a lot of good work. Stephen Meyer is um, in leadership there, and I mean he's written a couple of books that have just been like have made the evolution community just <laughs> freak out, you know. Uh, so, anyways, uh, they just have a lot of good a lot of good people, good thinkers who are doing some great work there. Thank you. I'm a full-time professor at Dallas Baptist University, uh -huh. and um, my counterpart attended a conference recently at TCU uh, where they publicly stated out loud that they would not hire any Christian professors, and um, the same with SMU, the same with Baylor. And so as parents, my daughter is 16, so I'm looking at this content from two yeah. different lenses. Right. And I think it's the biggest... Um, as a, I'm not from Texas, but my husband is. And it's a, I think Texan parents are sort of just assuming, oh, TCU and Baylor and SMU, those are wonderful Christian universities. And I get transfer students into our College of Business that are coming from those universities yeah. who have been shamed, laughed at, failed mm. um, on papers and such because of their Christian beliefs. Um, and so uh, I, I just wanted to put an exclamation point behind what you're saying because yeah. this is real. Yeah, I appreciate that. And actually, one of the points you were making there, I don't know if this was intentional, but a lot of these places that are claiming to be Christian universities, we tend to think like, oh, well, I'll just send our kids there and that'll be like a safe place. But oftentimes, because there's this expectation that it's a Christian university, maybe their guard is more down and you know the friends that they uh, you know, make at these universities, they presume are biblical Christians who are trying to follow consistent with their Christian faith, and oftentimes that's necessar not necessarily the case, and they oftentimes succumb to false ideas, you know, pro-gay theology, you know, critical race theory, whatever, that are um, marketed as Christian notions, but aren't biblical at all. And so, again, I'm not saying don't send your kids to a Christian university, or do. I'm just simply saying just be aware that even if you do send them to there, you have to prepare and train them and equip them. In fact, most of my major frustration comes from people who profess to be Christians, but who are advancing non-biblical ideas, like it's okay to be non-binary, or you know, um, you know, critical race theory is a legitimate option for us as Christians, or and they're they're trying to baptize it in Christian lingo. And to me, that's the most frustrating. I expect it from secular culture, and I'm fine with the Richard Dawkins and the people who are saying there is no God and Christian. It's like, all right, bring me that person any day. But the people who come in who profess to be believers but just, you know, um, bring in compromise to the church, that's the most frustrating to me. And too often I see that at a lot of Christian universities. Not because they're trying to teach that, but just because anybody can go to that university who claims to be Christian, no matter where they are spiritually. So we just have to be aware of that. That's all. Good. Anything else? Alan, were you talking about the nurture part? Yeah. Uh, nurturing their wounds. Can you talk a little bit more about that? What what, what were you sp talking about specifically with their wounds and 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 uh, with with uh, as we kind of prepare our kids? Yeah. Well, with regards to wounds, what I'm talking about is if you in do the previous thing, which is involve them, you take them to a university, you have them read a book like Richard Dawkins' book, or you have them, you know, befriend someone who, you know, is you know, you know they probably have secular friends, and have them just really lean into those relationships it's quite likely that they'll have situations where they're presented with an idea they're not prepared to deal with, you know, or maybe they're challenged, you know, uh, and they just don't know how to address the challenge. And that's what I mean by wounds. It's like they'll come away maybe having some doubts in their mind. Maybe they'll have some skepticism about whether this will work or whether their faith can handle it. And it's those kinds of wounds that I'm talking about. That's why it's so important for me whenever I do a mission trip that after they've been exposed to like, you know, four hours of Muslim scholars criticizing the Bible or after they've been exposed to abortion choice advocates just pummeling them about abortion. Well, I want to step back and say, hey, well, did you find anything that they said convincing? You know, were you confused by anything? Like, I, you know, I want to process that. So that's what I mean by nurturing their, their tending to their wounds is to see our, our doubts developing and I know people then say, well, why put them in that situation in the first place? Why risk those doubts? Well, it's because they're going to be exposed to those ideas anyways at some point. Might as well 
get it out of the way when you're around and can process it with them rather than when they're off on their own and have to process it with, you know, whoever <laughs> is there, you know, or nobody for that matter. So that's what I mean by uh, tending to their wounds. Good. Last question for Any you then. Any other questions? Oh, right there? You have one? What's a person you work with, like, before marrying you? What's a person you work with now? Well, um, I would say that uh, as a parent or as a leader who, you know, could be a youth group or a teacher or whatever, that you're probably in the best decision to uh, judge when, is it, when are the age-appropriate times in their life that they're able to receive certain kind of things. In other words, I wouldn't even, I, I wouldn't say, oh, at, at age five, they should be doing this. And at age 10, they should be doing this, you know, because every kid is different. And so I don't know if you're referring to your own child or not, but if you are, I would say as a parent, you're in the best position to know what they can handle. When my son was 10, I knew he could handle what I exposed him to. When my daughter was 10, I knew she couldn't. And so I didn't do that when she was 10. I waited until she was older, you know, because every kid's different. And I think as parents or as leaders, we should be able to be sensitive to when that's best. Now, having said that, I do believe that we should be training them in the truth from as early as possible. Like, I actually like catechisms, you know, and so when my kids were very, very young and their ability to memorize things was just amazing, I would just go through catechism, you know. Hey, you know, uh, you know, uh, who is God? You know, what is the church for? You know, uh, how are you made? And they just an memorize these questions and answers because I want them to become grounded in truth. And so, um, you know, one of the challenges that my family, is this going to be posted online? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so one of the challenges that my particular family ha experiences is that um, we have a number of family members that are close to my wife and I who identify as gay and lesbian. And so, uh, you know, these gay and lesbian people are routinely at our house and they have been ever since, you know, <laughs> you know, my wife and I were together. And so raising children in that environment also presents unique challenges and questions as to, well, what should we do? What should we allow when these people come over? Like, should we set boundaries and whatever? So very early on, we thought, well, okay, you know, when they're like super, super young, we're not going to be teaching them about homosexuality per se. But what we did do is say, well, hey, look, um, what is a family? A family is a mommy and a daddy, you know, you know, with kids or whatever. So we were laying the foundation for certain basics that were simple for them to understand. As they got older, we incorporated more information onto that skeleton, if you will, you know, with more meat and talked about, you know, the possible variations, you know. Some, sometimes, you know, families don't work out this way. There's maybe a death or a divorce or whatever. And then as they've gotten older, we've incorporated more things like, okay, now there's homosexuality and transgenderism. And so by starting at a young age, teaching them basics, fundamentals, as they got older, they were able to recognize deviations from what ought to be, if you will. And so I would say as early as you can, you want to incorporate things that are basic and straightforward, but maybe not, you know, just coming out with abortion when they're five years old, you know, but like, hey, look, mommy has a, you know, has a bump here. That's because your brother or sister is in here. You know, it's like there's a real person in there. So I'm not teaching about abortion, but I am talking as if what's inside mom is a, is a real human being. That's your sibling, you know, or, you know, what is marriage? What are mommy and daddy? You know, and so on and so forth. So uh, I think that can happen as early as you can communicate. But um, but as to when you're bringing in false ideas and doing this kind of training, that's going to be has to be decided by people who who know your who know the children. And if, if you're a parent, then you would kn you're the best person to know. Okay, I know my kid can handle this now, but maybe not this right now. Maybe that later, you know. And different kids are different. So does that make sense? So as early as possible, but at age appropriate ways. I guess is what <laughs> I'd say. You know.